Today's episode is brought to you by the Tax Defense Group. Due to the global pandemic, the deadline to file your taxes for 2019 was pushed back to July 15th, 2020. If you haven't filed for 19 yet, there's good news. The Tax Defense Group can e-file your taxes for you. The process is quick, and for millions of people, you'll get money back. So, what are you waiting for? Call the Tax Defense Group today at 800-850-7973 to get started. That number again is 800 800- 850-7973, and you can visit them online at thetaxdefensegroup.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Writer Junkie. Are you thinking about starting a business or a side hustle? For all businesses to be successful, you need a website. Writer Junkie offers website development, content writing, and SEO services for business websites. Call Writer Junkie today at 805-587-7966, and you can visit them online at writerjunkie.com. What's going on, everybody? Welcome into another episode of the Lakers Outsiders Weekly Podcast brought to you by UCAS Studios. I am your host, Gary Kester, here with you as always. And I am not by myself today. I actually have somebody to talk to um, without just looking in the mirror and looking at my own reflection. So Hani Amadian is with me today. Hani, uh, I feel like it's been a while. Uh, a lot of crazy stuff going on uh, in the world since I did one of these. How are you holding up? Pretty good. I uh- I do want to point out, though, that I feel like I am looking in the mirror uh, on the Skype call, but um, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm doing good. I'm, I'm really glad that uh, we're doing a podcast together for the first time in approximately 16 years. <laughs> yeah, when, uh, you know, I, when I thought we would be recording a podcast on June 15th, I figured we'd be talking about a Lakers championship or a finals Wait. victory of some sort. Is that not what we're doing today? Oh, I mean, well, we're going to talk about the future Lakers uh, championship, but you know, I, it, I, I figured we'd be popping champagne tonight and just celebrating and all that, but you know, the world had other ideas, I guess. So, Good. <laughs> all right. So today, uh, on the last uh, episode, I was by myself and just talked about kind of the proposed voted on and agreed upon format to resume the NBA season in the playoffs. Today we're going to talk a little more about that. And we're going to talk about uh, some player concerns uh, that have kind of stemmed up here recently and uh, talk about our thoughts on that. And then in the second segment of this, we will be talking about the Anthony Davis trade because the day we are recording this, June 15th, is the one-year anniversary of the Lakers agreeing to acquire Anthony Davis. So um, we're going to kind of just talk about how that trade looks now compared to what it, how it did then and, and all that fun stuff. So uh, before I get started, I don't know if he'll ever listen to this podcast, but I want to send a congratulations out to Pete Zayas. Uh, many of you know him as Laker Film Room. He uh, announced today, I, mean, I kind of knew it was, was coming, but uh, that he was hired by the Lakers and he's going to be doing uh, some content, some other stuff with them. Uh, so Rob Polinka, you better watch out. Pete's coming for your job. <laughs> he's coming for Palenka's job. He's coming for Vogel's job. He's coming for Jeannie Buss's job. <laughs> he's just gonna <laughs> own the Lakers here in a couple of years. The way he's uh, he's climbing the ranks. So uh, no, but uh, congrats to Pete. I mean, that's awesome. Genuinely great dude, and uh, very very happy. I'm glad to see him just continue to work his way up and see that hard work pay off. So that was really really cool to see today. So. Absolutely. All right, let's talk about some Lakers basketball, NBA basketball, sort of. Uh, Still haven't gotten there, but we have uh, a plan that's in place uh, to resume the NBA season, shooting for the end of July, uh, which now is about six weeks away. So we're getting there, slowly but surely we're getting there. Uh, Mentioned this on the last episode, there are, what was it, 22 teams, basically the bottom eight teams are eliminated and uh, can start looking ahead to mock draft season. But 
22 teams, regular season games for, for basically for every team. And I went over the schedule uh, for the Lakers in the, in the last episode as well. And um, yeah, I guess just what are your initial thoughts on, on how the NBA came to this conclusion? You know, we saw a lot of different proposals like reseeding one to 16 and they decided to keep the conferences, play eight more regular season games um, in Orlando, and then they'll just go, with your traditional conference uh, playoff setting. So uh, what was your thought on, on kind of the process and, and the format that they, they came or came to an agreement on? So I, I don't mind the format at all. I think it's a pretty solid um, compromise of, you know what, we're not going to take every team, but we want to be fair. And for the teams that had a chance of making a run for the playoffs, we're going to give them that chance. Now, obviously there's a little bit of like, do the Suns really have a did the Suns really have a chance of making the playoffs? <laughs> Probably not. They don't really need to be there, but you know, whatever. Um, so I, I don't mind that. I, I like the idea of the play in games. I think that's a really cool wrinkle mm-hmm. to this. Um, if it even happens, uh, obviously it's not a guarantee that the, the play in games would happen. But as for the process goes, it kind of seemed like a crapshoot. Uh, just from all the different proposals that we spent really weeks hearing in the media of like whether they're gonna do the reseedings whether they're gonna do a world cup group stage thing <laughs> that seemed like a just a random idea out of nowhere because adam silver is enamored with making basketball like soccer which <laughs> part, part of me loves as a soccer fan but part of me is like what are you doing um <laughs> and then come to find out that after all these votings happen first of all not every team's representative voted i think i think either one or two of the representatives who went there on the vote the players again as a whole didn't vote on this only their uh their players association uh representatives did and then now a week after that all of a sudden we hear about all these different concerns that the players have that just seem to have not really been addressed in this vote as far as i can tell that vote was basically just on the format what what number of teams are going to be there what the playing games are going to look like what the series are going to look like but the nba kind of pushed it out like basketball is happening and we've all voted on it and agreed to it without really um having come to an agreement on you know how the players are gonna what how strict this bubble is going to be in orlando are are Mm -hmm. players going to be allowed to leave their hotel rooms or not uh, are uh, employees at Disney allowed to leave the bubble or not? And then, obviously, uh, as we've kind of heard this last week, uh, with a lot of players having concerns about whether they would be able to be leaders in their communities, as a lot of them have been, uh, with all the uh, protests going on around the country right now about uh, mm-hmm. police brutality and racial injustice, you know, a lot of NBA players have been very, very vocal or even just involved in those protests. Um, And I think it's a very fair concern that they have about whether they'd be able to do that when basketball comes out and whether basketball would be too much of a distraction for everybody when, uh, frankly, a much more important thing is going on. Um, So to me, I, (laughs) I, as, as glad as I was to hear that basketball would potentially be back and I wanna watch the Lakers win a championship hopefully, it just seems like there's so much still left to figure out. And yeah, they have six weeks until this presumed deadline or uh, the presumed start of the season, but it just seems like there's so much to figure out that it's hard to really uh, get excited about this. Yeah, that's kind of my thoughts was like, initially I was excited because it's like, all right, we figured out, you know, the plan, they came to an agreement and all that. So it was, it was good to see because I felt like the NBA basically – their thought process was kind of do what I do. Like if I'm undecided on like something I'm like, I'm going to take this to Twitter. Let's see what, <laughs> what Twitter, uh, how they feel about it. Cause that's what it felt like. They were just like, let's just poke this idea out there, leak this to a reporter and then we'll see how, yeah. how Twitter uh, reacts. And then like the, the world, the world cup, like group stage and stuff, stuff like that. I don't think was very popular. <laughs> uh, the reseeding like one to 16, I thought was pretty popular. Um, it was, you know, I mean, I think every idea that they threw out there was going to be a little, uh, polarizing, uh, to say the least, but ultimately the format that they came, you know, to an agreement on, I mean, 
I thought it was very impressive that they found a way to get the Suns in the playoff somehow. <laughs> Even if it's uh, a very outside chance. <laughs> but, um, no, I mean, it's... I, I thought they did pretty good with the with the final resolution. Um, it's it's a very tricky situation, you know. When because my biggest issue, I guess, was with the timeline and kind of the thought process for next season. Because I yeah. thought the format, I thought the format for the to finish the season, you know, you give teams eight games, you know, you get some more of that like regular season revenue for the like TV and stuff like that. Plus, you give players an opportunity to have a camp. Um, and there was talk. I don't. I don't remember uh, if it was like part of the plan, but there was talk of preseason games, kind of. Yeah. Um, so you know, you get players a chance to kind of get their legs a little bit, uh, even though you know I think it probably takes about twenty, twenty-five games for these guys to like really get fully in season form and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I mean, you give them a, a little brief period to kind of get their legs under them before they start playoff uh, basketball and things like that. And, um, you know, it gives some of these teams at least a chance, you know, if if you're a nine seed, I think you had to be within three games of the eight seed to get that play in game, uh, which I thought was a good idea because it, you know, incentivizes those teams to, to really play because, you know, for those those teams that weren't in the playoff hunt, there was talk of, you know, having them play in, in some of these games. And it was like, it just doesn't really make much sense in terms of player safety and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. especially when those teams are just worried about their draft pick anyway. Um, but yeah, I was, I was more concerned, I guess about next season, you know, the target date was December 1st, which for the two finals teams, that's, I mean, it was about a six or seven week turnaround, um, which is very, very quick. Uh, I know they just had three months, Stuff and all that, but still very very quick after you know a regular playoff run. I mean, there's not going to be travel and stuff like that, um, but there's still you know still a pretty high demand of games in a short amount of time. So yeah. um, hopefully that gets pushed back to like Christmas. I think that would probably be the the ideal um, time for them because that's when the NFL season is supposed to kind of wrap up. And the NBA could just kind of, you know, take the torch. Um, they'll have to, I mean, battle with NFL playoffs for the first couple of weeks and stuff like that. But um, I'm just hope I hope that the off season period is extended a little bit. But yeah, I mean, I like the format. I mean, I thought it was all good. I didn't really have any complaints about it. Um, so I'm ready for them to roll the ball out there and and you know get the games going. But like you said, there is so much to figure out in terms of not only like next season, but um, player safety, like you mentioned, you know, the, the Disney employees, the, the, because you know, at a certain point they'll allow, um, players to bring family and guests and stuff like that. And, um, you just know some players aren't going to want to be cooped up that long, you know, right. and understandably. So it's, it's difficult. I think a lot of people struggled being quarantined, even at their own house, uh, yeah. for, for an extended period of time. So, um, yeah, a lot, a lot of stuff to figure out. And, you know, there's been a couple of Lakers here lately that have kind of um, voiced their their opinion on restarting the NBA season and, you know, the, the potential risks and, you know, not only of, you know, player safety, but also, like you like you said, just being kind of a distraction to what's going on in the world. They're just, you know, no matter what you know how how big of a basketball fan you might be there's just really no denying that there are bigger things happening in the world right now and especially in this country that are much bigger than than any game um let alone just basketball so um Avery Bradley and Dwight Howard both voice there and they're possibly you know basketball coming back being a distraction and and really kind of steering attention away from the real issues at hand. Um, and I, you know, certainly understand where they're coming from and I totally respect their opinion, um, on that. Uh, what are, I guess, what are your thoughts on, um, you know, we've seen a couple of Lakers now kind of step up and obviously LeBron, uh, has a very powerful voice and he's been, you know, I mean, kind of both ways on this when you kind of look at like his social media and stuff like that, he's been very, uh, strong advocate, for um you know these protests that we're seeing and 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 rightfully so and but he also i think understands kind of the damage that it could cause the league by yeah. canceling this season and, and losing out on all that money and it could really hurt the players 
um, short and long term. So I guess wh- where what are your kind of thoughts on on where we've seen some of these some of the Laker players stand in these issues? Yeah, um, I mean it's kind of hard to really be on either side of this issue. It's it's genuinely something that you uh, kind of just have to sit back and listen to the players and see what their thoughts are because mm-hmm. I get both sides of this. I, I totally get um, players who think one coming back to play basketball is good for their wallets, frankly. And, and that's especially for, for players who aren't stars. They aren't like, you know, Kyrie Irving has been kind of labeled as kind of the leader of this group that's saying, Hey, maybe we shouldn't be playing. Um, you know, he makes a, ton of money so it doesn't affect him as much as it does the 12th man on the nets um Mm -hmm. and so for those players i understand wanting to come back because that's how they make them living um i also understand this idea that if basketball is back and it's really the only major north american sport that's back at the time um that maybe that actually gives them more of a platform uh, to really be a vocal leader in the community um, and, and kind of bring a lot of more uh, awareness, bring a lot more light into the sort of coverage of all these protests. On the other hand, I also think that, you know, we've seen quite a lot of change come about from these protests uh, mm-hmm. already in, in these last few weeks. Obviously not nearly enough, but I, to, it's hard to kind of, um, separate that from the fact that we are in the middle of this pandemic where nothing is going on. People don't have jobs to go to and there's no distractions like sports and entertainment. And so it's kind of allowed people to put so much of their focus on this issue. Um, and that's why you're seeing so many people out on the streets protesting. You're seeing so many people on social media, so many people um, devoting a lot of their time and their money into these efforts. And, you know, when I see that, it's it's hard to argue with guys like Dwight Howard, Avery Bradley, Kyrie, that, yeah, maybe basketball coming back would be bad for this because it would be a distraction. People mm-hmm. would, you know, all of us are, are guilty of this, of using sports and using entertainment as distractions for real-world things. And a lot of times it's very useful. Um, but when you're at this kind of crossroads of such an important time in our history um, and ideally a time where we can make a lot of changes... Uh, a lot of positive changes, then it's, you know, you, you got to kind of grapple with the fact that, you know, this isn't nearly important enough. And if if the right way to do this, and if the players specifically think that the right way to do this is to say, no basketball this season, we're going to try to figure this out and we're going to try to use our time and our resources for a much more important cause, then I'm all for it. You know, I, I frankly, I'd be disappointed that I don't get to watch my favorite team hopefully win a championship, but I, I would be much more disappointed if um, their voices were silenced and, and uh, such an important time on such an important issue specifically for them. Yeah. That's, that's like my big fear is, you know, if the season resumes and I think the season is going to resume. Um, I just think there's, there's enough, influence with the top players like Chris Paul, LeBron James, and so on and so forth, uh, that the season's going to resume whether, you know, certain guys sit out or not. Um, you know, so I, you know, I think ideally it would be good for, for those players to not only get paid and get, you know, the money that they, um, sign their contracts for, and, and they can use that money, you know, for a variety of reasons, whether it's for personal reasons or, you know, to help, uh, this movement, um, so ideally you kind of get a blend of both. Um, but I, I do worry that if games resume, it's a very easy way for a lot of people to sweep this under the rug and basically try and put it back to square one or at yeah. least try to. So, uh, that would be my concern for that. So hopefully, um, you know, the players can all find kind of a common ground on not only the, you know, safety for themselves, um, in the, in the, you know, that Orlando bubble setting, um, but also, you know, have, you know, utilize this platform and, and continue, um, you know, to continue this movement um, that, that is so important. And, and um, it's something that our society really needs and really needs to see more progress with. So, um, 
really tricky situation, but you know, like we said, they do have time to figure it out. It, they've got a lot of things to figure out, um, but hopefully we can, you know, just continue to see progress and just see the players, uh, you know, find a common ground. I just worry about <clears throat> if too many players sit out um, and then there's labor dispute, a CBA, you know, yeah. uh, discussions and, and negotiations and stuff like that, that the owners would, you know, really hold that against players and, um, it could just cause a, a big mess, you know, for, for the players. And, you know, I'm always for the players over owners, um, because I think a lot of times owners, uh, dodge a lot of responsibility, um, and accountability. Yeah. So, um, and, and I mean, they're the, the super rich, you know, so I'm all about players getting paid and, and utilizing their platform how they want to. So, uh, kind of like you said, I, I think best thing for like us Obviously, we can voice our opinions on on the matter, but the best thing is probably um, to kind of sit back and listen um, to exactly. where those players are coming from, and and you know, kind of just see see what they do, and just kind of go based on that. So, yeah, I mean, at at the end of the day, it's a majority black league with most, if not all, of its players having experienced. Um, there's these issues that people are protesting right now in their mm -hmm. lives and you know for you and i who are not black and are not nba players to really be sitting here and be like nah they should be playing is just it's asinine so you know for everybody who either profits from the league as like a media member or a blogger or whatever or somebody who just enjoys it as entertainment really the most you can do is sit back listen to the players and whatever they decide be okay with that absolutely 100 percent. all right we're going to take a quick break and then when we come back uh we are going to talk a little bit we're going to kind of come back to basketball come a little uh full circle i guess here and uh talk about the anthony davis trade and of of the lakers acquiring their second superstar and and kind of what that trade looked like then what we think it looks like now and, and all that so here's a quick uh, break and, and a word from our sponsors and we will be right back today's episode is brought to you by the tax defense group due to the global pandemic the deadline to file your taxes for 2019 was pushed back to july 15th 2020. if you haven't filed for 19 yet there's good news the tax defense group can e-file your taxes for you the process is quick and for millions of people, you'll get money back. So, what are you waiting for? Call the Tax Defense Group today at 800-850-7973 to get started. That number again is 800-850-7973, and you can visit them online at thetaxdefensegroup.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Writer Junkie. Are you thinking about starting a business or a side hustle? For all businesses to be successful, you need a website. Writer Junkie offers website development, content writing, and SEO services for business websites. Call Writer Junkie today at 805-587-7966, and you can visit them online at writerjunkie.com. All right, so as I mentioned, this is the time that we're recording this, of course. The one-year anniversary that the Lakers acquired Anthony Davis, uh, they gave up quite a bit. I mean, I think at the time, you know, it was kind of mixed opinions on it. I think everybody was stoked that the Lakers acquired Anthony Davis. I mean, to me, Anthony Davis is a guy, I mean, coming into last season, I thought was like a top six or seven player in the league. Uh, extremely, extremely good. I thought he'd be a perfect fit next to LeBron. Uh, and that's proven to be true. I mean, AD has been everything that we could have hoped in. in some. Uh, time, I think I was a little concerned that the Lakers, who I thought were betting against themselves, gave up maybe a little too much. I didn't think that they maybe utilized their leverage um, as as well as they could have. But ultimately, mm -hmm. they got the deal done. They acquired the superstar, made their other superstar very happy. Um, and, you know, it's all going to hinge on if Anthony Davis resigns after this season, whenever it concludes. And if he does, if he resigns a new deal, then, you know, to me, the, the Lakers definitely win their side of the trade. Um, I, you know, I think it's a – kind of a rare trade that I think both teams won. Uh, yeah. I think both teams kind of got exactly what they were looking for. And uh, obviously I think the Lakers would have liked to keep like one of Brandon Ingram or, or Lonzo ball. Um, but they didn't. And, you know, it is what it is, but um, 
looking back on it now, I guess what are your thoughts on on the trade? Like and now, like, has your opinion of it changed at all, or has it kind of been what you basically expected? Um, for the most part, pretty much what I expected. Uh, you're right that the Lakers probably did give up too much, uh, especially when you factor in all the picks, and that they were bidding against themselves for <laughs> basically like four months. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, it, it was a it was a desperate decision that I think has paid off, um, and you can kind of see how it's paid off this year, and that they've you know been the one of the best teams in the league and. I think Anthony Davis was the rare player that you were willing always to give up too much to get. Um, Mm -hmm. And the Lakers were kind of in that position previously with guys like Paul George and Kawhi Leonard, and they uh, weren't willing to give up as much. And I think, you know, for whatever reason that the front office had, uh, Anthony Davis was the player that they said, look, he's a perfect fit for the superstar that we already have, which I think is a major part of this is that they already had somebody um, and we're willing to bet that for however long that we have Anthony Davis, which hopefully will be for the next decade or so, he's going to be a more crucial piece than, you know, Lonzo Ball would have been, Brandon Ingram would have been, Josh Hart would have been, and whoever we would have gotten with those picks would have been. Mm-hmm. And honestly, like, it's not an awful bet. And the one thing that has really sort of changed uh, since that trade has happened is that Brandon Ingram's really blossomed into practically a star uh, for mm-hmm. the Pelicans, which is something that we all kind of expected to happen and predicted to happen, but it was obviously far from certain. Um, he had a lot of great moments as a Laker and he had a lot of not so great moments as a Laker as well. So um, I think that's been the one massive change that I think Pelicans fans should be really happy, excited about that. Hey, maybe this trade was really great for us, even even better than we thought, because Brandon Ingram might legitimately be a star that can uh, play next to Zion for a very very long time. Um, and of course, Lonzo and Josh Hart have also been been great, uh, mm-hmm. just not at, at the same level. Um, so to me, looking back on it a year later, I, it's hard to say that it wasn't worth it. It's you know it's going to take a long time for us to really be able to see what the repercussions of this are, whether Anthony Davis resigns, which we all expect he will, um, Mm -hmm. how long he stays as a Laker, how he develops, whether this is his prime, like his peak right now, um, whether they win titles with him. And then on the other side, what happens with Lonzo, Brandon Ingram and those picks, like what kind of players those turn into. So you know, at least a year after the fact, it's an absolute win for me. Um, it's hard not to be a win when you're the number one seed in the West and have a very, very good chance of winning a championship. Yeah, it's it's absolutely a win. You know, I think a lot of people kind of confused um, some emotions at the time. That it was almost like people thought other Laker fans didn't want Anthony Davis, like they would have rather had the young core and. You know, it was it was more of a uh, like we said, kind of the Lakers just bidding against themselves. Um, which I guess you know, you you brought up a good point that the Lakers were kind of in that situation with Paul George and Kawhi Leonard, where they could have you know tried to trade for those guys. I didn't think Popovich was going to trade Kawhi to the Lakers yeah. at all. Uh, the Pacers certainly didn't want to trade Paul George to the Lakers. Uh, teams don't really like to trade with the Lakers. I mean, it was pulling it was like pulling teeth with the Pelicans. Um, you know, to finally get that deal done and maneuvering from from Rich Paul and and that camp. So, uh, I mean, it's definitely a win because I've always believed in the NBA. I mean, we've just seen it year after year. You win with superstars in this league. Like, if you can get your hands on a superstar, just do it. You know, yeah. um, and I think you know, like you mentioned, going through those scenarios with those, you know, with Paul George, with Kawhi Leonard, with the Lakers kind of took the stance of like, hey, we can wait a year and get these guys in free agency. They thought they would get Paul George, you know, and he changed his mind and, you know, re-signed with Oklahoma City and then, what was it, a year later, demanded a trade to the Clippers. So, um, yeah. you know, and Kawhi, same thing. Lakers thought that they could get him. They couldn't. And, you know, they this time they 
weren't going to leave it up to that. And they, they pulled the trigger on it and they, they got a deal done. And ultimately, you know, uh, I got to give Rob Polinka credit for that, you know, for getting the deal done because acquiring a superstar on a trade, even when you have leverage overly easy, um, yeah. by any means, you know, uh, it did help that they had LeBron already, you know, if they didn't have LeBron, I don't know if they offer the same package for him um, to just get Anthony Davis by himself on a one-year deal who could possibly leave because then, you know, you're kind of stripping the cupboard a little bare. Um, but when you've got LeBron already there, like, yeah, it was it was a no-brainer. And I think, I mean, the Lakers, too, had reached a point with those young guys that they had to get a deal done. Like, they couldn't have it fall through again and then yeah. welcome those guys back in the locker room. Like, hey, just kidding. Like, we know we put you guys through this like three times now, but uh, right. we believe in you guys. Like, at a certain point, they just you kind of lose, you know, you lose their faith. So um, they got a deal done. I mean, like I said at the, at the time, was really hoping that they could keep uh, one of those three young guys or maybe it's you know, Kuz for Ingram or Alonzo Ball because um, I thought the, those two would have fit in a little better. You know, it is what it is. I mean, they got to keep Kuzma who, you know, whether you love him or hate him, does have his moments where he's a very valuable player. Um, and then, I mean, we show that the, the Lakers scouting department can find kind of those, some of those hidden gems. I mean, like an Alex Caruso, that can be an, a valuable player, uh, in the rotation. So, um, obviously the resources are a little drier now with the, the picks going out, but if you got the superstars. I mean, we've seen the Lakers load up this roster with cheap veteran contracts. I mean, if, yeah. if you have two legitimate superstars that can, Bob, you know, probably deliver you a championship. You're going to get, you know, those good veteran players that take less money. Um, like we've seen with the Lakers. I mean, me and you growing up in our childhood, you know, seeing, you know, Gary Payton, Carl Malone take cheap contracts, run our tests. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, we saw it a number of times, you know, yeah. so it's kind of getting back to winning culture, uh, winning brand of basketball. I think that uh, makes, especially makes the trade so worth it. And if, you know, if Anthony Davis resigns, then it's you know it's it's all good. I don't think anybody will ever complain that the Lakers gave up too much or anything like that. So, yeah, no brainer in my mind. And not a lot of things show the value of just getting a superstar on your team than the Lakers spending most of free agency waiting on a Kawhi Leonard decision and not signing anybody, and then still being pretty damn good even when he said no because they have two superstars and the, you know the veterans they were able to get at the end of free agency were good enough. Right. Yeah. I mean, a guy, getting a guy like Danny Green who probably could have just went and signed a deal and yeah. you know didn't wait um, said, "Hey, like I'll, I'll wait because if Kawhi doesn't pick you guys, then I'll." gladly like he even openly yeah. admitted like why he signed with the lakers because they got ad and lebron like yeah uh so you you get those superstars and everything else kind of falls into place you know our entire lives i mean pretty much the the entire duration of their franchise's history so uh it's kind of get the superstars and then everything else will fall into place so um it's crazy that it's been a year it's it's really crazy that it's been a year um i've thoroughly enjoyed anthony davis as a laker and hopefully we get to uh keep him as a Laker for, for a very, very long time because he is, as we've seen, insanely, insanely good. And I think um, we're, one of these next podcasts that we, we do, we're going to kind of talk about what uh, a good playoff run and, and a potential championship would do for his legacy. So uh, a little spoiler for the maybe the next podcast that we do. So, all right, I think we're going to get out of here. Unless, Hani, you got anything uh, you want to add in before we take off? Uh, yeah, I'll just add that. Uh, so a couple of weeks ago, we uh, asked a lot of our followers to donate some money to the Minneapolis Bail Fund when the protests were just starting. Just wanted to thank everybody that donated or at least shared that and uh, was helping us raise some money. Uh, at some point or another, I'm going to be eating a lot of hot sauce because of that. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks <laughs> that's gonna be a treat for me and all of our, we're gonna have to make sure that we get that one on video for yeah, sure like we yeah, might, we'll, do, we'll do that one on video for sure we might have to do that one live Ooh, man <laughs> we won't be able to bleep out me uh giving up a lot of f-bombs but that <laughs> might make for good entertainment so <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll do it. We'll do it late at night on like a weekend. Night. <laughs> All the kids will be in bed. So, 
All right. Well, you guys have that to look forward to. I'm looking forward to that. So, <laughs> all right. As always, guys, uh, thank you guys so much for listening. Um, you can subscribe to Lakers Outsiders and UCAS Studios uh, if you're listening to this on YouTube. Uh, be sure to like this video. You can subscribe to us on YouTube wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, you can follow Lakers Outsiders on Twitter and Instagram at Lakers Outsiders. And you can like us on Facebook as well and get all of our content on LakersOutsiders.com. You can follow Hani on Twitter. Uh, just hat at Hani Om, H-O-N-I-A-H-M. Uh, you, can't, you can't mistake the, the Twitter avatar. It's, it's, it's legendary. So uh, <laughs> you can follow me on Twitter as well, just at Gary Kester. Um, yeah. Also Thanks a legendary t- t- Twitter avatar. Just <laughs> <laughs> want to throw that out there. <laughs> oh boy, yeah, it's 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 been a while. It's been a while. All right, well, thanks again, guys, for listening. We're gonna get out of here and uh, hopefully record another one of these soon. And uh, until next time, this is Gary Kester with Hani Amanian and the Lakers Outsiders signing off. Shout out Pete Zayas. <laughs>